Um, so a quick note about the reading, um, and you may have noticed already that I mentioned um, Cho by first name. Uh, um, eagle-eyed, uh, uh, those, of, those amongst you, eagle-eyed readers may have noticed that if you, if you bothered to look at the acknowledgments, which is a good practice to do, um, you'll have seen my name, which is a fact that I'm very, very proud of. Um, Steve he was my dissertation advisor and my graduate advisor when I was at the University of Iowa. I worked with Steve. Um, Steve is my principal mentor, you know, to this day. Um, my, you know, I guess like if, I hope that you had read this and um, it didn't seem completely alien because Steve was so instrumental to my development. Um, uh, uh, as, a, as an academic, um, as, as, a, as a film researcher. And so, you know, he really kind of um, helped me sort of um, figure out what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it and in what ways I wanted to say it, which is, you know, to this, to this day, I'm like a, absurdly appreciative and grateful and also incredibly proud to, you know, be his student. Um, um, and also, you know, to, like, you know, that, that, that I'm in this book in that way. Right, um, so that I just wanted to kind of make that very, very clear. That um, in that sense, um, I hope that again, I hope that the book doesn't seem too alien, and also it also means that I kind of have like understand this um, in a way. And can I can, can I, it's very dense and difficult, but I, I think I can kind of help you through it um, if if the lecture isn't enough. So um, on part one, in talking about peppermint candy which is a film that we'll watch next semester. Um, um, it's a film that I write about in my dissertation. Um, and if you haven't seen it but, and won't be joining us next semester, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth seeing. But kind of like the relationship between peppermint candy national subjects or national subjectivity and national history. It's a film that's about the democratization process that we've talked about briefly in the last lecture. Um, the Jun Duan regime between 1980 and 1987, um, who took power after um, the, the president slash military dictator before him who had grabbed power in a coup, um, Park uh, Chung-hee, Park Chung -hee had been assassinated. Um, in 1980, when there was a giant mobilization um, of students and protesters in the city of Gwangju, which is actually very close, it was about an hour away from um, where uh, uh, I did my military service, um, which is in the background of all of this, the fact that, that like, I, I was in the military too. Um, so I would go to Gwangju every time that I would go on leave. Um, you're actually like kind of seeing me process this too. I've never really thought about this, but this was a city that I've, I'm, 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 I'm pretty familiar with, especially with the area around Gwangju Station, and it never occurred to me that this is where thousands of people were killed. Um, the Gwangju Uprising or the Gwangju Massacre, so you have all these people sort of, you know, kind of come down to the city, and, um, you know, the, the president basically mobilizes the military. Um, and kills and, and opens fire on civilians. They're civilians, right? The military opens fire on civilians. Um, the numbers to this day are disputed. You know, thousands murdered. Um, it, the question becomes, everyone, but like how many thousands, right? Um, just something worth thinking about for sure. But, you know, you can only imagine why this is something where the president has the, the, the armed forces um, open firing on its own population is something that like still remains this massive scar, and that's that's like one way to understand kind of Korean cinema is that like trauma, and, and Korean culture in general, like trauma is something that defines um, Korea for sure, and it's something that like you know kind of trauma. That's the thing about trauma is like it just never it never goes away. It keeps coming back. Trauma repeats, right? Now that's the next part. Where are we going to? Right. So. Trauma, repetition, and brutality. And 
so Steve reads um, the film as Young Ho, the main character, sort of repeating his trauma. Um, and, 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 and as each time that he does, um, instead of that trauma being an opportunity for him to think and critically reconsider, it just it's another opportunity for him to go, nope, nope, nope. Like, that's what he's doing, right? And then that basically ends up catastrophically. Like, you know, his psyche can't handle it because, you know, it's like, you know. Um, and so on 11, he, he notes, Young Ho acts out, exercising, so or, or rather, oh, no, I'm, I'm moving past that. Uh, and with each repetition, Young Ho stubbornly disavows the possibility of reflecting and working through the past, right? So moving on. Again, these are all big ideas. Um, uh, I'm not going to spend a terrible amount of time on each, right? But the question, the philosophical, so, but but please do you know bring them up if you have questions. The question of sovereignty, sovereignty as sovereign, the sovereign subject who historically was the king, right? or the god, right, the, mon the, the monarch. Sovereignty is transferred into each and every one of us after the enlightenment and humanism, you know. So sovereignty, you know, can also be, so it's like the, the I guess, different ways to put it is that like, you know, the right to one's own self, so, both physically and mentally. So when we're talking like the body, like I have rights to do with my own body, that is sovereignty. The idea of like agency, right? Um, Self-determination. Um, you know, power really and control. Um, we probably hear sovereign in everyday language the most when we talk about um, sovereign nation, right? Which means that a country has the right to self-determine, to self-govern independence, right? So colonialism is, you know, when, when, when a nation does not have sovereignty, right? Um, uh, where was I going with that? That's precisely where you see that metaphor again, where the national subject, the citizen, has sovereignty over her or his body the same way as a sort of um, unit of the national body, the country. It's a metaphor that extends to both. You guys tracking so far? I have no idea because I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the camera. But, but that makes sense, right? Um, this is the sort of question of sovereignty, right? Um, so whenever you know you hear someone talking about uh, my rights, my choice, my agency, um, uh, uh, my prerogative, the more kind of technical and sort of expansive um, idea, the theory that's coming from is is the sort of the, the philosophical question of sovereignty, right? That's the big like. It all has roots in, in you know, in Western humanism, right? Um, and so, in that sense, what actually is sovereignty in the classical sense? What is the, the actual definition? And this is why, after studying with Steve, once we had kind of gone through this material, it had so much explanatory power for me in the sense that it was a, it was like thinking about sovereignty not only helped me understand Korean cinema, it helped me understand my own behavior and it helped me understand why people behave the way that they behave. So the sovereign, it's like the sovereign or sovereignty is the ability to choose the exception. So if we go to the monarch or the king, right, if you have all the subjects, right, and the monarch says that that subject um, deserves to die, he is making uh, an exception or choosing 
the exception amongst his subjects, the exception being death within life, right? Everyone else gets to live, but you get to die. Similarly, right, the, 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 the sovereign or the monarch has the ability to pardon. So if you have, let's say, the country goes to war with another country, you have POWs, they're set to be executed, the, 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 um, the, the king can also say, except for that one, right? Um, I pardon that one. That is the absolute power and agency that the sovereign has and the, you know, over other people's lives, right? So that power gets transferred to ourselves. And so what I mean by you know, like the explanatory power of this idea, when you see people behaving in ways that are inconsistent, right? So it's like all the time, every day, this is why, like, I, I, again, just to kind of, to sort of hammer this point home, this is precisely why I don't like, or I, I kind of shy away from familiar or everyday terms, and I like jargon. And it's not to seem, not because I'm trying to seem smart, although, I, I, of course, I'm trying to do that. It's not because I'm trying to be alienating. But if I say hypocrisy or hypocritical or contradiction. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, and, and then we're off to the races, and we just keep, you know, running in circles. But the moment you say sovereign, and the sovereign ability to choose the exception, the other person goes, huh? What? And it creates that pause, which is the same pause that, that Yoho, like, sort of turns away from. That can be a moment where we can actually say, what are we talking about? Let's, you know, let's talk about it, let's suss it out. So in that sense, when you see someone being, quote-unquote, hypocritical, or making a contradiction, where, you know, um, they, they say, like, for example, uh, I'll give you a really great example that I actually saw. I saw um, uh, in, in Iowa, a man, a white man was jaywalking, and he saw a couple of Chinese students that were parking on the street. And as he's jaywalking, he's yelling at them, you can't do that. So what allows him, because they're, so, so, they're, so the, the point I'm trying to make is they're both breaking the law. That is fact, right? He can't, like, jaywalking is against the law. Parking on a sidewalk is against the law. But what allows him to have the moral ground to absolve himself of his, you know, transgression, but also cast judgment on someone else's? It's the sovereign ability, because of course he can. That anyone can do that. Anyone can be contradictory. Anyone can be hypocritical. We all have the capacity and ability to do that. Whether that's moral or ethical is an entirely ish different issue. Whether that's legal, it's a different issue. But we are capable of doing that. And this is precisely why you might now understand, like this entire semester, I'm basically asking us, don't be that person. Don't, don't, choose, like, don't, you know, just because we have so sovereign capacity, don't live life in a way that benefits only me, but not others. That doesn't, that doesn't, you know, like, this is why I keep talking about good faith, right? You know, treat the other as I would treat myself, right? That's really what all of this is about. Does, does that make sense? I hope so. But again, um, it's totally fine if it doesn't, because this is all, again, like, really kind of difficult stuff. So in that sense, on 11, similar page, uh, Steve notes, Yoho acts out exercising sovereign power over the people he tortures as well as sovereignty over his past. So he's torturing, you know, these student activists because he's good and they're bad. And he can make that decision because he's sovereign, he has power. We're both Koreans, we're both men, we're both people alive in, in 1980, but you're different from me. I'm the exception. I'm the good one. Or you're the exception. You're the bad one, which allows him, that gives him the authority to torture, in addition to him being an exceptional figure as a, a police officer, right, as a detective. Um, and sovereignty over his past, where he can look back, right, and he can just kind of write that off as, it, like, it's not that I was a horrible person. That was a one-off. That was a goof. That was a mistake. That was a, you know, that was an exception. That's not who I am. Same whenever someone, you know, like, makes a mistake. You know, like, this is why everyone, like, you know, you've heard me make fun of, like, celebrity excuses before. But every time, that's exactly what they do is that they, it, instead of a reconciliation and a negotiation of, of, of the act, right? And the person that, 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 that um, carried through with that act 
it's actually another moment of sovereign power of saying like, oh, oh, that that don't that's not me. That was an exception. The norm is over here, but I get to choose and say that that wasn't who I really am when I did I said that or did that terrible thing. You just need to forget that. That's basically what Steve is talking about here. And all of this is kind of happening. The film is happening in the aftermath of um, the financial crisis, the IMF crisis, right? Um, I'm trying to think if uh, my throat is kind of, so I'll just point it out instead of reading out. Um, but on 13, let's see, uh, at, the, at the end of section one, just the idea of aporia, which, is, which comes up again and again in, 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 in the book, but the idea of an irresolvable problematic. So the kind of importance of like when you see something that's like an irresolvable problem, like this really big thing and it's there, like an elephant in the room, kind of having the courage to acknowledge that it's there and trying to tackle it even though it, it, you know, it probably won't come to satisfactory resolution instead of sort of just like cowardly or conveniently turning away, right? Um, okay, yeah, let's move on.